Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for making it back. We have a few colleagues still coming in, but we will get started with the program. I'd like to again thank Canadian Banknote for sponsoring our networking break. As mentioned this morning, discussions throughout the symposium will revolve around the three phases of air travel, before departure, before departure and flight, and arrival. To get us started with before departure considerations, I'm happy to introduce the moderator of session three, Dr. Joseph Attic. He is the executive chairman of ID4 Africa and the Identity Council. Joseph is a recognized worldwide expert and advocate on identity matters and one of the leading figures on the emergence of the identity industry more than 25 years ago. When he retired from the industry in 2010, he founded the Identity Council, whose goal is to help nations and international organizations design and launch responsible digital identity programs. The aim is to accelerate socioeconomic development, improve service delivery and security, and enhance privacy and people's rights. Joseph, we are very much looking forward to your panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank IKO for giving me the chance to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, I go back a long time, almost 20 years with IKO, um, back to the early days of deliberation on the electronic passport. Uh, it's amazing how fast time flies. Um, <clears throat> someone this morning mentioned an interesting figure which said that 20% um, <clears throat> of the world's population has a hard time actually proving who they are, uh, presenting proof of their identity. <clears throat> actually, uh, the, the number is a little bit more dramatic than that because our analysis shows that 50 to 60% of those 20% are actually in Africa. So they're all concentrated in a, in a, in a place. <clears throat> and so when we look at the uh, people in Africa that do not have a proof of identity, it's a very significant number. And that's why ID for Africa was founded as a movement in 2014 to essentially help ensure by 2030 that every African has and is empowered with a legal identity consistent with the sustainable development goal, which is 16.9. Um, I'm not going to motivate identity to a group that, that has been doing identity all day long. I mean, I mean, identity is a cornerstone for inclusion. It's a cornerstone for establishing trust and security. It's part of every process you can think about in a modern society. And so as a consequence, um, what we want to do this afternoon is benefit from the fact that we have an impressive panel of experts who are practitioners. These are people who have actually implemented identity systems <clears throat> who are going to share with us their experiences and some of the innovations that they are considering in the implementation of identity systems, which essentially is the foundation for essentially any um, issuance of travel documents down the line or the, the, the trip program. So this is sort of the pre-commencement um, of the travel. Um, we have a tight time frame, so I'm going to not say too many words. Uh, I will start with our first speaker, who is Mrs. Rodia Maas, who is the director at the National Office for Identity Data at the Dutch Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relations. Rodia is credited with redesigning many of the identification processes in Holland and is a thought leader recognized in the ID process design and redesign. Um, she will give us a presentation about the innovations in identity management and what they could mean to TRIP, and specifically with an intriguing title, are we really ready for these innovations? Um, let's see. The podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Ladies and gentlemen, I would first of all like to thank ICAO for the opportunity and the invitation to speak at this prestigious ICAO Symposium on the travel, Traveler Identification Program. My organization, 
the National Office for Identity Data in the Netherlands plays a key role in managing and distributing personal data to and from municipalities and other affiliates that use the data to provide public services of a variety of sorts. We also play a central role in managing and monitoring the infrastructure for the production, distribution and innovation of the Dutch travel documents. In my presentation, I will start with setting the scene on identity management. I will address three developments that are being explored in my organization, namely the development of a virtual identity card, the possibility that blockchain technology offers, and the risk of photomorphing. With exploring the collaboration and role of ICAO, I shall end my presentation. Identity management requires a well-considered policy, good direction, and a robust infrastructure in which registrations, documents, processes, and expertise must interact in good coherence. Identity management in the public sector, organizing and managing the national identities infrastructure requires constant concern of my organization. Changing needs of citizens, new forms of fraud, and the availability of technical possibilities require a permanent attentiveness and investment in the improvement of the identity infrastructure. Experiences have shown that it is of vital importance that all the separate elements of the identity infrastructure be viewed and approached as a part of a unified whole. Nowadays, it's also conditional on the development of identity management to include the international dimension. The concern of identity management is since the 38th ICAO Assembly in 2013 also firmly embedded in the ICAO TRIP strategy. Since then, the task of ICAO is no longer limited to standards for passports, but it's with evidence of identity, document insurance and control, inspection system and tools, and interoperable uh, applications extended to the whole identity infrastructure. With this development, the ICAO TRIP strategy is a direction for governments in development identity management at national level. The ICAO TRIP strategy has impact as well on the research activities of my organization. Identity management and its infrastructure are determined by large numbers of laws. Also about traditions and social acceptant parame acceptable parameters. Nowadays, all countries do recognize the need for an undisputed proof of identity, although we are not that far yet. That's the main reason why governments are investing significantly in their country's identity infrastructure. These investments are triggered by the TRIP strategy, in which, which puts governments into taking timely action. A second reason for the fact that governments are becoming more and more aware of the need to professionally organize the national identity infrastructure is the increasing lost and stolen documents and growing risk of identity fraud. Cross-border issues like document and identity fraud demand a cross-border approach. The TRIP strategy is the fundament of a coherent international identity management policy and a systematic approach. This is one of the reasons why my organization supports the valuable work of, work of ICAO with expertise and I will continue to do so in the future. I wonder, however, if ICAO has sufficient attention to the dynamics in which the various developments are taking place. I will go into that later in my presentation. As I announced in my, in my intro introduction, I will now explain the various, various developments we are working on. Since 1994, the Netherlands has used an identity card. Dutch citizens must be able to identify themselves, for instance, improving your over 18 if you want to buy alcohol. In addition to the passport, the Dutch identity card is also designated as an identity document. Characteristic of the Dutch documents is that they have great similarities to each other, which we designate as a family of documents. The Dutch identity card, therefore, has many similarities with the passport and complies with all the specifications specified by ICAO in DOC 9303. 
I talked about the changing needs of citizens. The use of smartphones seems to be a standard worldwide. This availability also affects pr products and services that can be purchased. There has been a whole industry that deals with the development of apps. The Dutch government also uses apps for offering services to its citizens. From that point of view, I started an investigation to answer the question of whether identity verification can also be made by a, a virtual Dutch uh, identity card. In order to answer that question, it was first defined what a virtual Dutch identity card is, namely an authentic identity document that can reliably verify the identity of the user in the virtual environment. The authenticity of the virtual ID card is guaranteed in several ways. First, the citizens must have a Dutch identity card and then can start a registration process for a virtual card. The ID card is read with a mobile device and the biometric data is checked to determine that the document holder has a valid ID. If verification is positive, information is stored on the mobile device and it goes without saying that privacy, security, trustworthiness and ease of use are important starting points for the virtual Dutch identity card. Preparations are being made to test the virtual ID card in 2018. Perhaps at the next ICAO symposium, I can inform you about the experiences we get in the Netherlands with a virtual ID card. But today, however, I will show you a short animation movie that gives you an impression about identity verification based on a virtual identity card. And let's see whether the technique works. Do you remember standing in line You're standing in line now. <laughs> no? It doesn't work. It works. Do you remember standing in line for ages to enter that amazing bar? The doorman asks you for ID to check your age. You reach for your back pocket. Too bad. You forgot your ID. There goes the evening. Or you wanted to shop for a bottle of wine for that romantic dinner, but had no way to prove you're 18. Now, there's another way. You present a virtual ID on your smartphone. With an inspection app, the cashier or doorman checks that it's a valid and authentic ID and verifies your age. How does it work? You can easily create a virtual ID on your smartphone. You simply hold your ID to your smartphone to read the data. Then make a selfie. And the app matches it to the photo on your ID using biometrics. A secure personal key is then registered in a database. And done! You now have a valid ID on your phone. It contains a QR code that changes every 5 seconds, so it can't be falsified. From now on, you can leave your ID at home. And the great thing is, everyone benefits. For you, this solution is convenient, user-friendly and privacy by design, because you can select what you want to show. For companies, the virtual ID allows for faster and better ID checks, which is efficient and guarantees legal compliance. And governments can do checks where the companies comply with legal norms. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Virtual ID, the future of identity. <laughs> okay, well that's one thing, but we'll explore even more. We'll explore, for instance, the blockchain, one of the latest developments which is using technology that is used also for a Bitcoin, the virtual currency. A blockchain is a chain of digital files, blocks of links, that are linked together. The entire chain is in turn a digital file. A blockchain is never finished, as participants in a blockchain can always attach new links to the chain. However, once added, links can never be removed again. 
A chain can contain anything, a contract, a patent, a deed of ownership, a piece of software. The Dutch government wants to explore whether blockchain technology can also be used in the government services. A consortium has been established in which parties from industry, government and science closely cooperate. The collaboration is aimed at answering the question of whether blockchain is interesting to be used in the government. During a hackathon organized in the Netherlands in February this year, it became clear that the reliable identity data are crucial for blockchain technology. This makes the National Office for Identity Data an important link to successfully use this blockchain. We are working on a test in which we will deliver statements about the identity of a citizen. Those statements will be placed on the blockchain and then can be used. The citizen itself plays an important role in that. He can decide whether, based on the self seven identity principle, can you, who can use this information. This principle of self sovereign identity is, as it were, guarantees the fundamental rights of citizens in the digital world. It goes without saying that I will also use the results of this test to find out whether it can be used in the travel document uh, process. During an RFI held in 2013, for the first time, photomorphing was discussed, a risk that photographs of two different people were merged into one photo that could successfully be used by two persons. Since 2014, government and scientists have conducted a lot of research to determine how morphing risk can be reduced. In July, my organization has held a two-day workshop on photomorphing. In, cooperate, in cooperation with the universities from Italy, Germany, Norway and the Netherlands, and also other governments, international organizations and industries, we have had this workshop. And some conclusions from the workshop are, morphing has different risks in order to develop the right measures, cooperation between different parties is required. The risk of photomorphing arises at the beginning of the chain, namely in the application process of the documents. There is no reliable algorithm available to, to, to determine morphing. Untrained civil servants in the process of application and control hardly have a chance to discover a photomorph. And last, morphing poses a high risk for border control. Conclusions that encourage me in cooperation with others to continue looking for solutions aimed at reducing these risks. In 2015, my organization carry out, carried out a survey on identity structure in 2030. This exploration has worked successfully with ICAO, other governments, international organizations and universities. The results of that exploration are recorded in a white paper, Identity Management in 2030. It's interesting to see how the developments that I spoke about also relate to developments in this white paper. And at last, ICAO's role, the characteristics of the various, various developments I spoke about is its international character. In my introduction, I outlined the dynamics that influence the development of identity infrastructure from changing citizens' needs, new forms of fraud and the technologies. Cooperation and coordination on the various developments is necessary and international organizations such as ICAO and ISO play an important role. With the development of ICAO TRIP implementation schedule, ICAO sets the direction for the future identity infrastructure and I hope that ICAO will be able to anticipate the various developments personally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Robia. Um, I think this is, this is great. You've established sort of the foundation for certain innovations that I'm sure we're going to hear about mm -hmm. over the next few years, specifically even within this TRIP uh, symposium series. We look forward to uh, hearing your findings on virtual identity cards or let's say mobile uh, on a mobile platform. Um, we are very anxious to see if blockchains make sense. I mean, this is really a buzzword that's happening all over the world, not just for uh, identity. Um, um, so it will be fantastic if 
you see applicability in the travel. And then, of course, um, the risks that you raised are definitely something to be taken seriously, especially that a lot of the travel uh, processes rely on face recognition. Great. Um, we are going to continue with the panel. Our next speakers are Simon Dagnan and Zoran Dokovic. They work for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They told me to ask you three questions, and those are the following. Number one, are you a state looking to improve your identity management system? This sounds like a commercial, but trust me, it is not. Two, how can a country assess the security gaps in its national system? And three, are you a private company or organization looking to support states in improving their civil registry systems? Simon and Zoran will present the OSCE's compendium of good practices in identity management and what that means for states, international organizations, and private companies. They promised me that they will keep it to 12 minutes, but we will see. This is a very useful document. I flipped through it uh, last week, and I was very impressed with the issues and the statistics and the numbers that they came up with. So please, uh, the podium is for the duo. Good afternoon, everyone. Your identity is like a shadow. Not always visible, and yet always present. That's a quote from an Italian poet, and I think it nicely summarizes the importance of identity management. Our identity is always present, and that's why it's so important that we have trust in our identity documents and our identity management systems. I read a story recently that Facebook can now accurately predict our personalities. Looking at the things that we like, our, the friends that we have, the pages that we share, it can figure out who our personality is, and it uses that to sell ads to us. Google does the same, using our email data, our location from Google Maps, YouTube videos. If we look at LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google, we're putting more and more of our identities online. And these social media sites are becoming a hunting ground for identity thieves. That's why we need to put even more emphasis on having secure, reliable, and trustworthy identity management systems. This time last year, I stood on this stage and I held up my Irish birth certificate. I wanted to show that this document had no security features, had no special printing techniques, and was just printed on normal printing paper. Yet this document is vital for my identity. And that's a problem. If we look at ICAO's traveler identification cycle, evidence of identity is the weakest link. Fortunately, this problem is now recognized. Now, I, I don't know whether it's because of my birth certificate or not, but I'll happily take some of the credit. The ICAO's Implementation and Capacity Building Working Group has been working steadily to give guidance on evidence of identity. The EU has now launched an action plan on travel document fraud. The OSCE, for its part, we began a process back in 2013, a consultation on civil registry systems and travel document issuance. We really ramped up these efforts in 2016 and 2017. We distributed a, a questionnaire to all 57 of our states and collected data on their civil registry systems. We then held a number of consultations to analyze the data and to peer review the good practices. And it's great to see some of the, the states and identity management experts here today. And I'm glad to say, I'm proud to say, that instead of my non-secure birth certificate, that I can now hold up the OSCE compendium on good practices in identity management. And rather than listening to me, I'm going to hand you over to the real driver and brains of the operation, and that's my colleague Zoran Djokovic. Over to you. Thank you, Simon, very much. 
So when it comes to the content of the compendium, the compendium is focusing on two main components of identity management. That is civil registration system, system that is uh, put in place in order to secure legally valid identity for all citizens on the territory and also uh, civil identification process, a process through which uh, legally recognized identity is linked uh, with the uh, natural person. Uh, in the compendium, we are also focusing on issuance of identity cards and travel documents. And in that context, we are looking into processes such as application process for uh, identity and travel documents, prevention of fraud, retention of data and management of these data in back office, identity management infrastructure, meaning how two systems support each other and how public administration actors uh, 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 function together on this task. And finally, we are looking into identity management of citizens on the territory, but also resident non-citizens, that means foreigners with uh, uh, regulated residency status. And finally, we have section on risk, risk analysis. So coming to civil registration, uh, uh, in the compendium, we elaborate briefly how civil registration is being conducted across the OSCE region, but then we look in particular about how this information is managed into databases. And we find that uh, in all of the countries, uh, civil registration is done uh, on the local level and information is maintained on the local databases. However, uh, there are increasingly these databases connected into some sort of a, a network that works among these local databases. And there are also two other approaches which is to aggregate all information from local databases either in civil register or in population register. And as uh, Simon mentioned earlier, we contacted participating states. We got response from 41 OSC participating states, giving us opportunity to aggregate uh, some statistical feedback on how some of these practices uh, are implemented um, on the, uh, across the OSC region. So for instance, here we see that um, uh, information on civil registration is largely digitized, almost 50% uh, in, in participating states has this information digital format. And when using uh, um, ma a management system of individual personal information, 85% of OSC participating states you, uh, rely on the use uh, uh, of unique uh, identification number PIN. Then moving on to civil identification, we recognize that all participating states issue uh, travel documents upon request by citizens, whereas situation with national identity cards is somewhat different. In 40 OSC participating, sta participating states, uh, national identity card is mandatory requirement for all citizens. It is issued only upon request by the citizens in nine participating states, and there are eight participating states that don't issue national identity cards whatsoever. The reason why we are focusing on national identity cards is that normally the information that is proved in the process of issuance of identity uh, cards largely facilitate the issuance of travel documents as well. So, when it comes to issuance of uh, uh, identity cards, travel documents, we are focusing on application and verification process, documentary evidence uh, uh, required in the process of application, whether there are any subsequent identity verifications conducted by, uh, by the back office. And also we are looking into two types of applications, first time issuance for minors, and, and adults, and we also look into renewal of the documents when they, are, they, they were documents previously issued. We also look into data management and data, data retention. So here is an example of what you may find in the, in the compendium. We list what uh, experts have concluded a good practice in terms of documentary evidence is required in the process of application. But then when we look into uh, identity verification process, that means that the authorities in general don't uh, recognize face value, those documents that are presented to them. They do additional verification. And this is what it means. We ask, do you do ex officio uh, uh, verification of submission? submitted information, and in more than 50% of the cases, authority says, yes, we are doing it all the time. And in terms of how this is being done, uh, um, 
everybody says pretty much that they are doing it online, which, mean, which implies that, that civil registration databases are largely digitized and interconnected with civil uh, identification authorities. So we see that uh, uh, authorities check civil register for birth records, for deceased persons, for marriage, and for marriage records. Um, then, uh, after identity is verified, we look into a uh, collection of biometric identifiers in database for in of the back office board for uh, identity cards and for travel documents. Uh, and we can see here that um, digital photo prevails as a, as a uh, 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 biometric information collected and also uh, to what extent um, uh, fingerprint information is stored in the back office database. And then we also take note of the fact that when it comes to inf biometric information on the medium on identity cards and travel documents, uh, it is expected that digital, uh, that digital photo will be there, but we see increased use of uh, fingerprint on the, on the document. Um, and then finally, for the, for the uh, uh, re renewal of the, of the document, uh, you can see large percent, in 80% of the cases, every subsequent request for, for renewal will be met with additional verifications on, on all information that are stored in the, in the database. And finally, we are looking into identity management of foreigners uh, with uh, uh, recognized resident status on the territory. We see here that uh, uh, almost by definition, a special identification number is, is assigned uh, to, the, to the foreigners on the territory, and more increased collection of biometric information, especially fingerprint, in the context of identity management of uh, 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 resident uh, non-citizens. And finally, <clears throat> I would like to say that if you look at the um, compendium, you will find a lot of information on risk analysis and fraud prevention, and you will find res reference information on uh, existing guidance materials, which is United Nations Statistics Division, which defines uh, standards on civil registration, uh, many of the ICAO standards and guidances that have been mentioned and will be mentioned during the symposium, and also OSC commitments that are relevant in this context. Um, I would also like to say that the uh, compendium is available for download um, at, the, at the following uh, OSC uh, web link. Um, so if you have a chance to collect this PowerPoint presentation uh, later on, you can use this link to get hold of the, uh, um, the, the document. And that concludes this rather, rather uh, co digested uh, 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 presentation of the uh, main features of the compendium. And now back over to Simon. In conclusion, I'd like to recall the, the questions that Joseph asked at the beginning. Are you a state looking to improve your identity management system? Would you like to assess the security gaps in your national system? Or are you a private company or international organization trying to support a state in improving their identity management system? If so, we believe that this compendium will be useful for you. We have hard copies up here on the stage. Please take as many as you'd like with you. We don't want to have to bring them back on the plane with us. As Zoran said, it's also available for free to download from our website. So please do so at any time that you'd like. I'll leave you with one last quote this time from an American comedian. It's a joke about identity management. I don't need to worry about identity theft because nobody wants to be me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon and Zoran. I think um, uh, more than ever, um, you remind us that the time is now for us to pay attention to the identity management practices because as we live in a modern society, more and more of our identification data and our identity habits are going online and are accessible to those who can do us harm. And so it is great to see 
um, a piece of work that's driven by real data from the field. This is what I loved about this uh, sort of, it's not taking the expert opinion by saying, well, here are some good ideas for you to, 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 to explore. But this is based on actual practitioners who have implemented these ideas. So thank you again for taking the initiative and making this valuable contribution to the world of identity management. Um, we continue now uh, to our third uh, speaker of this afternoon, which will be Mr. Flavio Ramon Borroca, who is the Director General of Technology and Information at the National Population Register of the Ministry of Interior in Argentina. He will share with us Argentina's impressive experience in setting up a federal registration network. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to be speaking in Spanish this afternoon. First of all, thank you to ICAO for giving us this opportunity to share Argentina's experience. We were faced with a challenge, namely we had to modernize our system of identification between 2010 and 2017. I'm going to try and tell you in 10 minutes what were the main challenges with which we were faced and how we overcame these challenges. First of all, in this presentation, I want to share my experience and my path for those who have uh, similar stories to mine. In Argentina, we have a, a, a federal a structure. There are 23 uh, provinces, and each of these provinces has their own legislation, their own constitution, and they have executive, legislative, and judicial power. So the first challenge is the following. We've got to the law 26413, which determines that each province should have its own civil registry. So the first challenge then was to see how we could communicate between these different civil uh, registries where we register the births, deaths, and marriages. The first action was to generate a network of civil registries and have interconnectivity. And how were we able to establish this network? The information from the civil registries that wasn't digitized back in 2010 started to be uh, connected and they started to circulate information. And we can see that we have two important documents in Argentina. First of all, there is the birth certificate. That is document signed by the doctor. And we take the impression of the baby's uh, 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 foot and also fingerprint from the mother. And this takes place in the birthing uh, room. And we have to ensure that the mother and the son's fingerprints and everything is registered in this uh, birth uh, certificate. And this takes place, as I said, in the uh, birthing room. And this is registered in uh, the book. And in the civil registries, we want this information to be able to uh, circulate with digital signatures and be digitized. So the first challenge was to connect all of this. And then secondly, we had to set up a network so that these documents could circulate in a secure fashion. Registration it takes place in the civil registry. The next challenge in Argentina is as follows. We've got law 17671 which determines that uh, we have the registration of birth and deaths and marriages, and that falls under the civil register. But when it comes to identification, that has to take place at a national level. So there's a national uh, identity registry where we register the whole national human potential of Argentina. So we're trying to show this in the drawing. We already have this network of civil registries that are interconnected in order to obtain a national identity. And then we wanted to connect these all to a centralized database. 
So the several registries register, for example, the, the births, and then the National Register of Persons identifies these. And this is where we poured in a great deal of uh, technology. Uh, we've heard about the biometric side of things, and you'll know the process that we're using. In between 2010 and 2007, we were able to biometrically register uh, 45,470,606 persons, that's with, uh, with foreign residents and Argentinian citizens. So all of the people who reside in our uh, country have an electronic uh, uh, file in the national database. So what do we do with this information? First of all, as has been said, and as takes place in almost all countries, we've got the uh, birth certificate, which gives a people's origin of their identity. And we wanted to digitize this. And we wanted to take the processing, and we wanted to introduce biometrics from the start. So we turned to the civil registers to get the uh, birth certificates. And with the citizen there, we took the biometric and biographic data. And when we took all that information together, we were able to generate this electronic file within the national database. One of the main uses for these uh, data is with uh, biometrics. We have double biometric identification for each uh, uh, citizen who's asking to obtain a passport or a national identity uh, card. So what do we do with the double biometrics? First of all, we have biometrics with uh, fingerprints within the AFIS uh, system uh, for the person who wants to uh, process this. And we do uh, biometric identification one-to-one. -one. And with the correct biometric identification, we can then carry out a facial uh, identification. And th there were a, a, a screen uh, a data capture of a normal processing uh, day. After they've carried out the biometric check of the fingerprints, they can have a biometric check of the face as well, which is carried out. So once we set up the database, from the centralized database, we actually obtained two uh, documents, namely the uh, passport and the national identity card. So the first conclusion was that the Argentinian uh, database is a centralized one, and it's one uh, single entity that gives identity, and it's one single entity that uh, provides these documents. But what other services can we provide with this database? identification uh, services to third parties and the private sector and also to the state. How does this work? As we use uh, biometrics to verify the identity of people on a, on a daily basis, uh, we were able to actually export these uh, services to different uh, public and private sector uh, players. In this way, we have identification uh, services based on fingerprints or based on face or identification services linked to the documents to determine that the document is uh, valid and is in force. All of these different uh, services have been up and running uh, uh, after seven years when we brought together all the Argentinian population. And one of the most important interoperability point of view is, of course, when it comes to uh, border crossing. So we work with the National Migration Director, which uh, uh, falls under the Ministry of the Interior, and they use the services of the national database. So each person who enters or exits over the Argentinian border can be uh, connected and can be verified online uh, against the national database. So that's one of the examples of this interoperability. Another example, which I thought would be interesting to share with you, is as follows. We've got a certain history now. We've been up and running for seven years. So for each citizen, we can safeguard the history of their processing uh, and applications. And we can see with the three photos here that we've got a little uh, girl here. And we can see the history of the processing and the most recent document that she's obtained. And in the second line, we've got a young person who's had various documents. And each document is registered in the national database. And we can see the evolution, the development of his physiognomy over time. So this uh, national uh, database shows us the whole history of the uh, population and the exchange of their uh, documents and their interactions with the biometric database. 
Another interesting point is as follows, namely we have family links as well. You can see here in these groups, you've got the mother, the father and the uh, children. So we're creating family links, formal family links between citizens. And so with a young person's passport, we can see who are their parents and vice versa. In this case here, we've got two uh, brothers in the first drawing plus their mother and father in the second one. We've just got one uh, single daughter. In the first case, these are native Argentinians. And second uh, drawing is uh, foreign residents because the processing here in terms of persons within the database does not make any uh, distinction as to whether the person is a permanent resident in uh, Argentina or is a temporary resident. No distinction is made. And finally, I wanted to show you some uh, uh, direct uh, data uh, screenshots so that at the border control posts or within the public administration where any need arises, they can gain access to this uh, digital uh, file where you've got the person at the centre of this file and then you've got the uh, rest of the information that's stored and available as well. Here we can see this young uh, uh, boy and you can see the parents here. And you can also look up their uh, birth certificate, which generated uh, or was at the origin of his identity. And you can also see the interactions they've had with the AFIS uh, uh, system. Because as I said a few minutes ago, each time a person carries out a biometric identification, they do this via the national uh, database. And the database stores all of these different verifications that are carried out. So over the lifetime of a person, we generate this uh, register and we can trace all the different interactions that they've had and what were the results of these verifications. Then uh, finally, I wanted to also show you this uh, final image where we verify the quality of the uh, photo in line with ICAO recommendations. So when we have a person in front of us, in front of a uh, uh, public administration, and we're trying to collect information to process that we can check whether they have a high quality uh, image of their photo and see how this happens. So by way of conclusion, having a centralized data base has allowed us to have a real advantage within a public administration as a whole. And I think I've got 40 seconds left, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flavio. It's, it's quite impressive to see the end-to-end um, solution within the identity chain. Um, what we've seen here, we've seen basically the harmonization of civil registration throughout the 23 provinces. We've seen the creation of the centralized, uh, let's call it the National Population Register, which actually may even be a family register because you're able to create family links, um, which at some point, uh, should you desire to create um, a household register, you might be able to create a household register which could be used for targeting, for social protection, and for poverty purposes. I, I'm not sure if that's the politics, but at least he set up the foundation to do that. And I also I've seen in your presentation the fact that not only did you enroll people, but you have also created uh, the identity services in order to use and exploit this data to serve the citizens who ultimately own that data and provided you that data. And hopefully, over time, this data will continue to support an ever-increasing number of applications. Um, Hopefully, this is all done within the context of um, an Argentinian law for data protection and privacy, which I'm sure is, is in, in place. Um, okay, we are going to continue. Um, so far, we've been hearing a lot of interesting um, um, practical um, developments and innovations and, and uh, experiences. Our fourth and last uh, presentation, but not least, of course, is a presentation that will be given by two speakers, um, Enrique Taborda Alvarez, who is the Principal Commissioner, Head of the Identity Documents Division of the National Police Force of Spain. Um, actually, Enrique has a very illustrious career with the Spanish police. He does look young, but the fact is you've almost had 40 years of service within, within the police, unless I'm wrong. But, but the fact is you've been around, you know um, identity like nobody else. 
Um, and the other is Valentin Ramirez, who is the project manager for the FNMT Spanish Royal Mint. Um, Valentin is a technical and biometric expert with significant practical experience who will be generously sharing it in today's presentation. Please, the podium is yours. Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, obviously in Spanish. So the Spanish electronic ID card is one of the oldest in Europe. We started with this uh, back in uh, 1951. And there we were controlling the movement of the uh, population after the uh, uh, Civil War and the Second World War. And today, we also have other obligations, other legal obligations, because almost all Spanish uh, citizens can obtain an ID uh, card uh, at six years of age or at 14 years of age. So the first uh, version of the uh, Spanish electronic ID card 3.0 has lots of different innovations compared to the electronic ID card that came out in 2006. So this electronic ID card 3.0 came out in 2015. It's relatively recent. And it incorporates lots of different uh, technological improvements, such as we can see as the antenna of the RFID, the NFC antenna. And that's really fundamental for the usage of this if you want to have uh, information apps uh, with your tablet and your mobile phone. And it's got a quicker and secure and more reliable chip involved in this. And the, there's more photography, which is uh, much bigger. And you've got a more pleasant and more secure image involved in this. And and it's also a travel document meeting with the ICAO uh, standards. It's a type of uh, passport and also an ID uh, card. And we have uh, developed this. And uh, we've had this two document uh, valid for now, uh, three years. And uh, annually, there's increases, and we hope that uh, we're going to exceed uh, 7 million uh, Spanish electronic uh, ID cards. Our population is of around 40 million, uh, and this year we have produced over 7 million national ID uh, documents. And for me, the keys of this uh, success and the greater use of this uh, uh, document uh, can be uh, summarized as follows. First of all, we've got a mixed model where there's been institutional cooperation between the national uh, Spanish uh, police uh, who manage this document and also the Spanish Royal Mint, which is the Spanish uh, uh, Institute uh, uh, represented by my colleague in this presentation. Then secondly, the national ID uh, card really integrates very well with uh, different uh, applications that are very much uh, used in uh, daily uh, life. And it, uh, these use uh, instruments such as tablets and uh, mobile uh, uh, phones, uh, which uh, accompany us from the minute we wake up in the morning. And thirdly, with this card, we can make accessible lots of different virtual applications so we can have relations with different ministries and different uh, government and uh, regional institutions and also have links with firms that have their uh, virtual offices open to accept this type of uh, mobile application. Then fourthly, we this can be uh, read via international standards because it's based on international uh, standards uh, such as everything that comes up when it comes to border control management such as AFES and others. And then fifthly, and it's uh, difficult to do this for as a governmental institute, but this has been a, a successful for citizens because it is easy to obtain this uh, card. 
because you just need to go with one single uh, visit uh, to one of 350 offices that are spread throughout uh, Spain. So the citizen goes and, and they can get this uh, document with this uh, uh, super complex uh, uh, technology and they can take it away from them, uh, away with them once they've made the application. It's a one shot. So any Spanish person uh, Today, when you talk about this uh, electronic identity card, we'll say that it allows them to carry out three different activities. First of all, they can travel with this card because it is recognized as a travel document throughout the European Union. And, and secondly, we can affirm our rights vis-a-vis -vis any Spanish uh, authority. And thirdly, and this is very important, we can also have uh, 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 links online. I can uh, go online and I can use, there's uh, an increasing number of applications that I can use online each day. So I can travel, I can affirm my rights and I can have a relationship or links on uh, line with lots of different guarantees. There's a guarantee of security and I can have confidence that my identity is not going to be uh, 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 stolen, no, there's not going to be an imposter, or it's not going to be used or abused by an another person to actually cause damage to a, th a third party. And uh, my time is up, so now I'll give the floor to my colleague. I'm going to talk about the electronic side of this. And I want to give you an ex this as an example for those who are in a different uh, stage because we have learned a great deal about this over the years. We've been improving things, enhancing things, and changing things. And I want to uh, tell you why we've made these changes and where we're heading. That's what I'm going to try and do because uh, in six minutes I can't say much. So if we look back uh, from the current electronic uh, card, we can see that we had the first electronic ID card in 2006, but uh, there were major restrictions. First of all, they did not have RFID antenna, nor did they have all of the digitized passport information, so uh, the, the data could be uh, uh, read and uh, could be used mainly just by the police. That's what it was uh, provided for. So why did we decide to come up with the uh, first uh, uh, project with not just a contact chip but with RF idea? Uh, back in 2005, we were discussing this a great deal to see how we should actually uh, technologically design this document and deal with the chip. And in uh, fact, the state of art uh, of technology back then was not as advanced uh, uh, as today. Uh, a common citizen could not just go in and buy an RFID antenna in a computer store. That certainly was not the case in Spain. And the uh, price was very high compared uh, to the uh, contact uh, readers. And as we wanted the citizens to be able to use this, we decided that we would just have only contacts uh, interface first of all. So that was why we came out with this first version, just based on contacts interface. However, by 2014, uh, when we wanted to develop a 3.0, in fact, between uh, version 1 and 2, there were no real changes apart from the administer administering the chip, but uh, the chip technology did not change. But when it came to version 3, we wanted to make significant uh, changes, and that's when we came back to this question of contacts, interfaces, and RFID. And the, the Spanish police have detected that uh, many people were stopping using uh, desktop uh, computers and were using tablets and mobile phone users instead, and we couldn't give them services with the current situation. So. We wanted uh, them to be able to use uh, the electronic idea via mobile phone, so that's why we had to go for NFC or RFID technology. Then there was also the question of data. To begin with, the data of the citizens was only available for police usage, but there were lots of different complaints. It was rather controversial. Some people said there should be free access, and others said no, it should just be for police use. So we were very conservative to begin with, and we wanted to wait and see what was going to happen with the project. And then there was another issue as well. We were dragged back by the fact that uh, the 
There were lots of questions around the uh, protection uh, features, and so we started to look at this question of the site, the supplemental access control, which allowed us to move forward, but that didn't exist initially. So we talked with the police services and uh, the uh, uh, data people and the manufacturers. So we decided to start with just uh, police usage and then see if we could move uh, forward. Then the PACE protocol came out, the password authenticated connection established to try and stop these uh, types of uh, attacks. It's a question of cryptography. But I've uh, put this up because that really resolved lots of different uh, problems that were uh, pending, and it allowed us to make uh, uh, progress in actually having a more free access to the uh, uh, data. So we came up with a 3.0 version, as I said, and, and it became a dual interface with uh, the uh, antennae and the uh, contacts interface, and it's also a travel document because all of the data were able to be uh, digitized in the meantime. and. Uh, here, I don't have much time to go into all of this, but you can see that the, this uh, Spanish electronic ID card is aligned with the European EIDAS regulation. Many of you are familiar with that regulation, and this allowed us to be able to use the electronic uh, signature with this version. And a third point where we've done a great deal of work is facilitating the use of this for mobile phones. There were lots of different uh, examples of various Android uh, codes, source codes uh, that were available. And if you go on our website, uh, you can uh, download uh, examples uh, which gives you all the different source codes because we compiled all of these and made uh, certain changes. And that uh, is something that we've used for electronic identity card. But there's lots of different applications. I've just given you a few examples up here on the screen, but these are very much functional and they're available to everyone. If you go into the uh, uh, Play Store, you can uh, look up uh, the uh, uh, developer of the Spanish Royal Mint developer and you'll see that there's lots of different apps that you can download and they work with the uh, Spanish electronic document and you can have connections with uh, administrations and give you uh, services just as you would do on the web with uh, normal conventional uh, cards. And here, with We've got a picture of one app that would allow you to purchase flights using your electronic uh, identity card so you can get the correct uh, citizens' uh, data and make a, a safe, uh, secure uh, purchase and ensure that the person who's buying the flight is uh, the uh, same person. And this is totally up and running, as I've said. Another functionality here is a hotel registration app in uh, Spain. Hotels have to send uh, a register of who's in their hotels to the police. So we We've developed an app uh, here for a tablet or mobile phone where you put in the electronic identity card data and then that generates a PDF and it's sent off to the police. And this has really simplified uh, things because now we have all of the data captured without any mistakes with the names of who's staying in the hotel. As I said, this can also be used as a travel document. And what's going to come out with the next version? Well, we're trying to uh, actually uh, line this up with a new passport data uh, structure, and uh, there's the new EI DAS regulation. So we're going to change the algorithms and the uh, size of the keys. We're going to update this, and we're going to have a more powerful chip as well with architecture Cortex M uh, technology. And I've got a small video that I'd like to show to you. It's just a one-minute video where it explains to you what's going to be the ideal world with interoperable e uh, uh, documents that could be accepted by all countries and how that would actually improve security as well. And it only lasts for a minute. Today is a very important day for our protagonist, Marina, because she has to attend a meeting in London. In order to manage everything quickly in a secure way, she decides to make all arrangements with her electronic ID card and her smartphone. With her Spanish electronic ID card and thanks to NFC technology, she fills in the reservation forms with her personal data, quickly and without mistakes. In addition, she signs the purchase to authenticate that she was really who has purchased the flight. 
Already at the airport, Marina goes directly to the automated security control, instead of waiting to cross the police control. Police immediately checks her electronic ID card and authorizes her departure. In just a few seconds, she is already in the boarding area. Once landed in London, Marina arrives at the automated border control terminals, the British AVZ terminals. Here she can use again her Spanish electronic ID card as a travel document to cross the border in a safety way for the country of arrival and without going to the common border control queue. Now Marina just needs to do her check-in at the hotel in London, once again with her Spanish electronic ID card automatically and through an app. Her citizen data are read thanks to the NFC technology and added without mistake to the hotel registration database. The Spanish electronic ID card is a secure document, versatile, interoperable and usable in different devices. A document adapted to digital users' needs. The Spanish electronic ID card is an identification document and a travel document as well. It's also according to all recent European regulations and OACI. Esto es todo. Muchas gracias. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Day for our protagonist, Marina, because she has to attend okay. a meeting in London. Um, Enrique and Valentin, I I heard several important innovations that I'd like to share with the with the assembly. Um, first of all, the fact that you've created a new generation identity document that is more secure while at the same time you're creating it through a process that's convenient for the citizen, which is the over-the-counter issuance instead of centralized issuance. That to me is very significant because as you know, there was a trend uh, a while back to move into central issuance because people were concerned that over-the-counter is not going to be secure. Here is an example of where uh, over-the-counter has been, if I, if I understood your presentation correctly, that's the mechanism by which. Over-the-counter is huge because you don't want the citizens to have to wait for their ID. They come to the office, they walk away with it. There's a satisfaction factor that you get from applying and receiving at the same time. The other thing that I thought was significant about your presentation was the fact that you showed a pathway to the interoperability of the identification services. In the Argentina presentation, we heard about the identification services being built on top of the um, on, on top of the National Population Register. Here is an example where you are ready for the IDAS um, uh, standard, which I believe um, would allow the citizens of any European state to function, prove their identity, open bank accounts, and, and conduct business as if they are in their own home country. So this would be a reference um, model that we can, we can use. Um, we only have two minutes for, for in this session. I'd like to check if there are any questions in the floor. And uh, here's one question in the front. Could you please state your country? Oui. I'd like to know how many... The Organis Sanis event is for me the best forum in the world to A. Get practical information on latest ATM developments B. To actively get in contact with the industrial experts from around the world and C. To have the opportunity to raise your voice and be sure to be listened to SWIM or ATM Information Management is the most important enabler for current ATM operations as well as the foundation for future ICAO concepts such as flight and flow centric operations and trajectory based operations. Please come to the Information Management stream and you will have a unique occasion to get latest news on global SWIM developments and implementations from around the world. I hope to see you all there. Hello everybody. The ICAO guys.